Sugar Regulatory Administration v. Central Azucarera de Bays Inc., GR No. 253821, March 6, 2023. This is part one of 160 cases decided by Associate Justice Mario V. Lopez, Chairman 2024 Bar Examination. Facts of the case In 2017 and 2018, the Sugar Regulatory Administration, SRA, issued several sugar orders allocating Class D world market sugar to ethanol producers. Central Azucarera de Bays Inc. Central Azucarera filed a petition for declaratory relief questioning the legality of the orders. Central Azucarera claimed the orders are ultra vires or beyond the SRA's authority. The SRA argued the orders are valid since it can regulate all sugar types, including those for ethanol production. The RTC declared the orders null and void, ruling that the DOE, not SRA, has jurisdiction over ethanol producers. The SRA appealed to the CA. Central Azucarera moved to dismiss the appeal, arguing that the proper remedy is a Rule 45 petition since only legal issues were raised. The CA dismissed the appeal holding that the controversy was purely legal and the SRA should have filed a Rule 45 petition before the Supreme Court. The SRA's petition for review on certiorari followed. Issue Whether the CA correctly dismissed the SRA's appeal for being the wrong mode of review and the SRA should have filed a Rule 45 petition involving pure questions of law. Ruling The Supreme Court denied the petition and affirmed the CA. The court agreed with the CA that the SRA availed the wrong mode of appeal since it raised pure questions of law on the RTC's jurisdiction and application of procedural rules. The SRA should have filed a Rule 45 petition before the Supreme Court. The improper appeal did not toll the reglementary period to file a Rule 45 petition. Consequently, the RTC's order became final and executory. People vs. Leocadio GR No. 227,396, February 22, 2023 2024 Bar Exam Series, Decisions of Associate Justice Mario V. Lopez, Bar Chairman. Part 2 of 160. Facts on March 26, 2002, 12-year-old AAA 227396 was instructed by her parents to collect payment for rice cakes from their neighbor Milo Leocadio. She never returned home. Her parents searched for her and reported her missing to the police the next day. The barangay officials then discovered AAA 227396 a lifeless body inside Leocadio's house. She was found underneath Leocadio's bed with a cloth wrapped around her mouth and nose, hands tied and twisted behind her back. The autopsy report showed that AAA 227396 died from asphyxia by suffocation. She also sustained 33 injuries all over her body including hymenal lacerations. Leocadio was charged with rape with homicide. At trial, Leocadio admitted killing AAA 227396 but claimed it was accidental, alleging he punched her chest when she awoke him and caused her to hit the wall. He denied raping her. The trial court found Leocadio guilty beyond reasonable doubt of rape with homicide based on circumstantial evidence. The Court of Appeals affirmed his conviction. Issue Whether the prosecution proved Leocadio's guilt beyond reasonable doubt for the complex crime of rape with homicide. Ruling the Supreme Court upheld Leocadio's conviction, finding that the circumstantial evidence constituted an unbroken chain linking Leocadio to the crime. His defense of accident is unavailing considering his punching of the victim was an unlawful act. The autopsy report showing the victim's injuries belied his claim of lack of intent. 
The medical findings of hymenal lacerations and dried blood proved the victim was raped. Doctrines of the case Corpus delicti in rape with homicide. The elements of rape and homicide must be proved beyond reasonable doubt. Proof of guilt through circumstantial evidence. This requires more than one circumstance, facts proving the circumstances, and an unbroken chain linking the accused to the crime. Defense of denial and alibi. These are self-serving claims that cannot prevail over positive evidence absent clear proof. Exempting circumstance of accident. The accused must prove the act was lawful, done with due care, injury was accidental, and no fault or intent. Tahira S. Ismael and Ida U. Ajijan v. People of the Philippines GR No. 234435-36, February 6, 2023. Welcome to Part 3 of 160 of Case Digest of the Decisions of Associate Justice Mario V. Lopez, Bar Chairman. Subscribe for more. Facts Petitioners Ismael and Ajijan were the municipal mayor and treasurer, respectively, of Lantawan, Basilan. The municipality had long-standing arrearages in remitting GSIS premium contributions of its employees. Despite demands from GSIS, the obligations remained unpaid during petitioner's term, prompting a complaint for malversation. Petitioners were charged before the Sandiganbayan for 1. Violation of the anti-graft law for causing undue injury in failing to remit GSIS contributions worth PHP 3.1M, and 2. Violation of the GSIS law for refusing and delaying the remittance of GSIS contributions. Petitioners argued the criminal complaints were defective for not including indispensable co-conspirators. They also invoked inordinate trial delay. On the merits, they claimed good faith and cited constraints like terrorism, lack of funds, and reliance on subordinates. The Sandiganbayan convicted petitioners on both charges. In this petition for review, petitioners assail their conviction. Primary issue. Whether petitioners are criminally liable for non-remittance of GSIS contributions. Supreme Court ruling. The Supreme Court acquitted petitioners of the anti-graft charge but affirmed their conviction for violating the GSIS law. Non-remittance of GSIS contributions is mala prohibita, hence criminal intent is not required. Petitioners failed to show absolutary circumstances for non-performance of their clear statutory duty. However, no proof of evident bad faith or gross negligence to convict petitioners of corruption under the anti-graft law. Important doctrines of the case. Failure to remit GSIS contributions is mala prohibita, intent to perpetrate the act is not required. Statutory violations must be attended by bad faith, evident partiality or gross negligence to constitute corrupt practices under the anti-graft law. Right to speedy disposition of cases is waived if the accused contributed to the delay. Non-inclusion of co-conspirators does not violate the right to be informed of accusations if the information sufficiently alleges material facts of offense. Office of the Court Administrator v. Judge Rufino S. Ferraris Jr. and Vivian N. Odrunya and Bank, A.M. No. MTJ 21001, May 22, 2023. Part 4 of 160 of Cases Decided by Bar Chairperson Mario Lopez for 2024 Bar Exams. Facts 
the Office of the Court Administrator, OCA, conducted a judicial audit of the Municipal Trial Court in Cities, Bridge. 7 in Davao City from August to September 2020 due to the compulsory retirement of presiding Judge Rufino Ferraris Jr. The audit discovered delays in deciding cases, resolving pending incidents, motions, implementing writs of execution, and taking appropriate action in criminal cases. It also found incorrect practices in records management, repertorial requirements, writ implementation, and incomplete court orders lacking details like hearing dates. Judge Ferraris and Clerk of Court Vivian Odrunia submitted comments explaining their actions. However, the OCA still found them administratively liable. It stated that Judge Ferraris failed to 1. Decide a civil case within 30 days under summary procedure rules. 2. Resolve pending incidents in several cases. 3. Take action in pending civil cases. And 4. Act on hundreds of criminal cases. It also found that he violated circulars on monthly, semestral docket reports and pre-trial guidelines. As for Odrunia, the OCA held her liable for failing to supervise court personnel on records management and accomplish accurate reports as clerk of court. As former sheriff, she was also liable for failing to submit returns, periodic reports on writ implementation or fully implementing writs. The OCA recommended fines equivalent to their salaries as penalties. Issue whether Judge Ferraris and Clerk of Court Odrunya should be held administratively liable for the audit findings. Ruling Yes, the court found Judge Ferraris guilty of gross neglect of duty, simple neglect of duty and violating rules, circulars. It also held Odrunya liable for gross and simple neglect of duty. However, it imposed modified fines due to mitigating circumstances. Important doctrines 1. Judges have a duty to dispose of cases promptly under the Code of Judicial Conduct and Procedural Rules. 2. A judge who incurs unreasonable delay in deciding cases or taking action is liable for gross or simple neglect of duty. 3. As ranking court officials, clerks of court must be diligent in performing duties like case management, report submission and writ implementation. Gross negligence in these tasks constitutes a serious offense. 4. Penalties on court personnel must consider mitigating factors like humanitarian reasons and previous good record. Spouses Velarde v. Heirs of Kandari GR No. 190057, October 17, 2022. Part 5 of 160 of cases decided by Associate Justice Mario Lopez, 2024 Bar Examination. Subscribe for more. Facts Petitioners are the heirs of Isagani Velarde who acquired several parcels of land from respondent Concepcion Kandari through a deed of sale with right to repurchase in 1978. Kandari failed to repurchase the properties within the stipulated period. In 1986, she executed a deed of quitclaim ceding ownership to Velarde. Some lots were titled in petitioners' names. After Velarde's death in 1987, Kandari claimed she was still the owner, instituted tenants, and collected rentals. Petitioners filed a complaint for quieting of title. The trial court ruled in favor of petitioners but the CA reversed, finding the conveyances null and void due to fraud. Issue whether petitioners have superior title over the disputed properties. Ruling The SC reinstated the trial court's decision upholding petitioners' ownership. Kandari failed to prove her allegations of fraud with clear and convincing evidence. The duly notarized deeds enjoy the presumption of regularity. Registration does not vest title but is merely evidence thereof. As Velarde's heirs, petitioners hold equitable title which entitles them to full ownership of the properties. So in summary, the SC ruled that the petitioners have superior title as heirs of the original buyer, 
reinstated the lower court's decision recognizing their ownership, and discussed important principles regarding fraud, notarized documents, registration and inheritance. Doctrines Here are some of the important doctrines and explanations discussed in the case. 1. Burden of proving fraud is on the party alleging it. Fraud is not presumed and must be proven by clear and convincing evidence. 2. Notarized documents enjoy presumption of regularity and are prima facie evidence of the facts stated therein. 3. Registration does not vest or create title. It is merely evidence of title. The court held that the original buyer retained ownership even if the titles were registered in petitioners' names prematurely. Registration does not divest rights already vested through legal modes of acquiring ownership. 4. Heirs hold equitable title to properties of the deceased. As heirs of the original buyer, the petitioners hold equitable title over the properties which entitled them to full ownership, despite the lack of registration under their names within the redemption period. 5. True nature of an action is determined by the allegations, not the caption. The court ruled that while captioned as quiet in the title, the allegations showed the complaint was actually for rye vindication, warranting determination of ownership.